This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. You ready? Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, before I begin, I just want to thank um, Sujit Sivasundaram, who spoke this morning, and Claire Anderson for uh, inviting me to come on board, um, and also Victoria Lane and all the team for putting together this event, um, wonderfully well organised event, and a very nice lunch spread as well. Um, so let me open this talk, um, as any good lapsed Catholic should, with a confession and a plea. My confession first, um, though I'll begin by considering the ways in which British archives, the National Archives at Kew in particular, can be used as a site for work on the global history of the Middle East, and the ways in which the materials they contain may allow us to conceive of a new history for this contrast of territories, transcending the conventional framework of area studies, I'll roam in the remainder of this talk, the last th third or so, rather more freely than my brief might strictly allow. For I'll use this opportunity to adumbrate some quite personal answers to a couple of the questions we have been invited to consider and explore in this year's Elmer seminar. Firstly, does the writing of global history call for an expansion of the historian's traditional archive and the incorporation of other traces of the past? And secondly, how can UK archives best support the kinds of work undertaken by global historians? Now, in answering the first of these two questions, I'll argue that we should think of newspapers and other forms of periodical print media, sources central for a variety of reasons to my own work on the intellectual history of the Middle East, not just as archival holdings, as pieces to be catalogued, stored, and preserved, but as archives of a sort in and of themselves. In my answer to the latter, to the second of these questions, I'll make a case for the crucial importance of British collections, an importance which only increases uh, in time as it sadly becomes ever more difficult to undertake research in the Middle East itself. And I want to make, in doing so, a plea for continuing the work begun by programmes like the British Library's um, Endangered Archives Project programme. Um, I particularly appreciate the invitation to think about these issues it's a rare opportunity to engage in an exercise that historians all too often shy away from, to reflect explicitly upon the nature of their, our, sources, and the composition of their, our, archives. We're used, of course, to listing the archives we've visited, the files we've consulted, in our bibliographies, arraying each one neatly under tidy headings and subheadings. And we're used also to enumerating them in our introductions, outlining their contents, their lacunae, their strengths and shortcomings. But if the former is unavoidable scholarly convention, a way of signalling our participation in an economy of trust whose commodities are files and letters, reports and memoranda, and whose letters of credit and bills of lading are footnotes and bibliographies, the latter is often a form of apologia. We often expound upon the content of our archives only to make clear, in an inversion of the phrase so beloved of acknowledgement writers, that any shortcomings are not our own, and that if all our diligent searching and sleuthing has not turned out the requisite document, the requisite source, it is not for want of trying. Historians, it would seem, and there are very many exceptions, but I'm generalising broadly, um, remain, for the most part, all too unwilling to engage in what Anne-Laura Stoller has called ethnographies of the archive. And here I quote from Stoller, critically reflecting on the making of documents and how we choose to use them, on archives not as sites of knowledge retrieval, uh, minds in which to extract, but knowledge production, and as cultural artefacts of fact production, taxonomies in the making. Archival work, then, can still be marked by an unspoken division of labour. Archivists thinking about their collections, as, if, as a brief for this year's seminar put it, reflecting on how to preserve and arrange and present them, while historians simply use them, like miners down the shaft digging away for a nugget or two. And I'm sorry to pick on the blurb, it's very much the hand that feeds, but the blurb said, archivists think about collections, historians use collections. Um, striking um, and interesting. In part, this practice, these practices I've just been outlining, perhaps because putting order in our own files is often for us, for historians, I mean, an ancillary affair to be reserved, as a French writer, Georges Birec, once put it, for those floating days at the beginning or the end of a given piece of work when one does not quite yet know whether one will get down to it, will hang on to those withdrawal tasks, tidying, classifying, ordering. It is, in a word, for many of us, procrastination. We all have our own systems of classification, 
A busy writing desk crowded with small piles of typescripts, notes, and off prints in Eric Oxworm's case. Um, and if I had the slide, um, that was the picture that was published with Mark Mazow's obituary for, um, for Eric Oxworm in The Guardian, a picture of his writing desk. Um, all the piles upon piles of shoeboxes filled with endless rows of index cards, marked in neat, small handwriting. I still remember occupying an entire wall of a supervisor's study, John Eilif, the Africanist John Eilif. Or increasingly, hard drives and databases, JPEGs and PDFs. All of this, we all know, is a necessary part of one's life, but one which, like going to the bank or option correspondence, is often kept back, as Behek surmised, for the fallow moments and the late hours, we were filling or killing time rather than doing work with a capital W. However, we may profit a great deal from thinking about the composition of archives even as we use their contents. The British National Archives, to take but one particularly opposite example, contain just what a historian of the Middle East, such as myself, might expect to find. Volumes of correspondence from ambassadors, consuls and consular agents. Arranged chronologically and bound together by year, they present a picture of the concerns of these representatives, sometimes slipping silently over months before a flurry of missives clustered around a particular incident. Some of these incidents have taken on at times great significance for historians of the region. Either like dispatches chronicling the progress of the general strike which marked Beirut in the early months of 1913, as the city's shopkeepers and notables protested the Ottoman state's peremptory dismissal of the Beirut Reform Committee's demands for administrative decentralization, the devolution of certain key aspects of government to provincial councils. Others seem more insignificant, the flotsam and jetsam thrown onto the beach by the endless flow of administrative co correspondence. The naturalization request of a consular employee, say, the documents provided in support, and there are many of these in the archives, or the report taking up several dispatches, the minor diplomatic imbroglio which ensued when a British consular official visited a Greek Catholic parish priest on a tour of the district of Saida, what's now southern Lebanon, raising in doing so the hackles of his French counterpart, who objected to this encroachment upon France's purportedly ab antiquo claim to protectorate over the Uniate Christians of the East. He said, these are our lot, you shouldn't be touching them, you shouldn't be visiting the parish priest without my consent. Here are the workings of British power, not in its cruder, if often complex, manifestations, counterinsurgency, tax collection, and other such tasks. But in a more modulated form, the claims and expectations of exterritoriality, the legalistic intricacies of protection, the claim making of various correspondence, the delicate and sometimes vaudevillian intricacies of diplomatic back and forth, and the intimate setting of the locality. And the same could be said, to take an example in a different register, um, different tone, I mean, uh, of the Dufferin Papers in the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. All the minutes of the International Commission called in the wake of their sectarian strife which rent apart Mount Lebanon in 1860, which Dufferin was a member. Here in the archives, in debates and deliberation and correspondence, with all their errata, their corrections, passages underlined or crossed through, their marginal inscriptions and queries, one sees the elaboration of novel forms and norms and practices of global power, of notions of intervention and definitions of the refugee, of, the, of that seeking asylum, the being seeking asylum. These still remained unstable, as the archival record reminds us, as late as 1899, when the British consul at Beirut recorded the arrival at Tripoli, just to the north, of a band of Cretan immigrants, I quote, Muslim refugees, again quoting from the same dispatch, who left the island in the wake of its administrative reform, and the status of these figures, of these subjects, remaining uncertain and in flux. By the close of the First World War, they had settled into a more or less settled form, defined and refined in reams of correspondence, minutes, and memoranda. As David, as David Armitage and others have long since pointed out, the archive offers up a powerful and pliable complement to the conventional sources of the intellectual historian, to legal treatises, pamphlets, and the like. For these, a Q and Belfast are the sources for a global intellectual history of the Middle East, or rather, an intellectual history of practices and norms which now have a global reach, which were first essayed and repeatedly applied in the Middle East.
myself some water quickly. Spill it on the dice. <coughs> but these archives are not simply an Andorra Stolas phrase, monuments of state, whose contents are anthologies of the prose of power, to paraphrase Renajit Guha. To be sure, they are, as Jacques Derrida noted, a lot of um, name dropping going on here, the home and address of power, whose resident files often provide enduring proof, the shifting concerns, discursive conventions, and bureaucratic norms and forms of the British imperial state and its far-flung agents. And they are a place whose guardians, archivists, and historians alike, are once charged with ensuring the physical security of their deposits and accorded a hermeneutic right over them, a right to interpret. Just as the archive itself is a site of authority, whose contents constitute power as much as they document it, so those who read these documents possess, in turn, the power to interpret. Nevertheless, it would be wrong to regard the archives only as monolithic repositories, for they are, in a sense, diasporic. And I mean by this not that they hold um, records of connections and movements, but rather that through them are dispersed stray documents of scattered provenance. They do not simply conform um, contrary to what Guha himself claims in the process of counterinsurgency, to the imperatives of rule and reason of state, enclose dispatches from the other side, and which enclose dispatches from the other side and entrap their voices in its own administrative concern. For there, amongst the correspondence between French and British officials on redrawing the administrative protocol of the autonomous province of Mount Lebanon, 1911 and 1912, one can find the petitions of local dignitaries village headmen, <coughs> clerics, and the like, calling for particular concessions and reforms. These are elaborate documents, often presented in triplicate in Arabic, French, and English. <coughs> in a revealing show of bureaucratic procedure, they unfurl to reveal the seals and signatures of these men, revealing quite literally the impress of authority. As I've argued elsewhere, these documents tell us something of the ways in which the inhabitants of Mount Lebanon understood their province in the years before the First World War. Not as an, administrative, an Ottoman administrative unit, but as an international entity, subject to the shared sovereignty of the concert of powers. But these are not, however, simply pieces of writing. They're artifacts, palpable remnants of past conceptions of political authority. It is important to be able to touch them, to unfurl them as a consul once would have done, to feel the dried, crusted wax on the finger. As Natalie Zimon Davis has recently warned in her preface to a translation of Arlette Farge's Le Goût de l'Archive, with, digi with digitization, there come great gains. But there are also losses. The loss, and I'm quoting Davis here, the loss of the object itself, of the marginal, notation, marginal notations missed by the camera or sometimes the finger that strays into the picture in Google Books, but that ghostly presence, of the paper not available to the touch, and the odd objects slipped surreptitiously into the holdings, like the parchment bracelets and the strange sack of seeds that Farge found herself in the Paris police archives, or the lock of hair of no Webster's hair, the American historian Jill Lepore, found in the Webster papers. We mustn't forget to treat the archive not just as a cache of documents, but also as a repository of objects to treat documents as objects, through which we can map the constellation of overlapping concerns which brought British administrators and officials into sometimes uneasy concern with a host of others. Archives is a heterotopia, as an inherently heterogeneous space. What is more, we must also think of other forms of documents as archives. This is the case, for instance, the newspapers, journals, and magazines which have increasingly formed an important part of my own work on the global intellectual history of the Arabic-speaking Eastern Mediterranean. These are, I wish to argue, archives in their own sense. They served as clearing houses of knowledge, encyclopedic compendia, whose editors and authors thought of themselves as compilers, as curators of information, whose task it was to distribute news and to formulate and disseminate novel conceptions of state and society, the past and the present, of law, love, and the self. To understand these, to understand the content of these, I contend, we must consider their form as much as their content, appreciate that they were thought of as dense nodes of knowledge, as sites of moral and political authority, and as instruments of instruction, in other words, as archives. <coughs> 
Moreover, these documents can be all that we have, can sometimes be all that we have in the absence of other archives. They are often, and this is why part of the reason why they are so very important, the only means we do possess now, right here and now, to reconstruct the intellectual lives of those who lived in and between Beirut, Jerusalem, Damascus, Cairo, Alexandria, and of retracing networks of correspondence and commerce which connected these cities in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean to other points of print production and the sexual debate, such as New York, Sao Paulo, Paris, and other places of Eastern Mediterranean diasporic life. The Lebanese National Archives were once stored in the country's National Museum in the center of Beirut. Stored in its basement, they formed a subterranean complement to the to the antiquities, the Byzantine necklaces and Phoenician sarcophagi displayed above. However, the museum fell from 1975 onwards on the demarcation line which split the city in two, an apt metaphor for the divided, conflicted understandings of the past which tore Lebanon apart from 75 onwards. Some of their archival collections were taken apart and returned to their donors. From public, they returned to being private, to being stored in houses, in cupboards, um, in basements. Others were destroyed in the Israeli firebombing of the museum in 1982. The National Archives now take up one rather humid, dank floor of an old office block in the centre of Beirut. They're open three hours a day, there's no air conditioning, um, and they only contain published materials, um, published reports of the Lebanese government and newspapers. So in a sense, they're not archives as most of us understand them, or only part of an archive. The National Library, meanwhile, the Lebanese National Library, existed until very recently in a Borgesian virtual form. It had a website, but no locale, no room of its own, no space of its own. Its book left to mould in containers at the port, um, a space, as we heard from Sujit earlier today, a space as much of disconnection as one of connection, very much disconnected from the rest of Lebanon, um, stored in transit. The Syrian National Archives and Library, for their part, were until recently, um, rather better maintained. And they served as a monument to the authoritarian Ba'athist state and its own particular projection of the past. The National Library was the Assad Library. But these two are now beyond our access. So we must treasure those archives that we have here in the United <coughs> Kingdom, conserve them, digitize them, and make them accessible, rather than conceal them off-site, as the School of Oriental and African Studies has recently done, sending its rich collection of periodicals <coughs> to the warehouses of Dagenham to rake room in its library for beanbags and workstations. And this is, the, uh, this is what I understand has happened, but I'd be very happy to be corrected and told that there was some other rationale at play. Um, and I apologize for singling out a single institution, but it was something that particularly peeved me when I went down there. Um, and we must also begin to think of ways, and here I'm concluding, to think of ways of building upon laudable initiatives like the British Library's Endage and Archives program. Amongst its many endeavours, in Burundi and Ethiopia and India, Senegal, St. Saint Heli Helena and Argentina, not all places of British imperial power, though many of them um, were once within uh, British informal, if not formal, um, empire. It has begun to conserve and digitise the periodical collections of the Al-Aqsa Mosque Library in Jerusalem, making them, making them available not just in Jerusalem, on site, in situ, where they're subject to the whims of access policy and the vagaries of political conditions, but across the world. This is a case then of conserving these archives, of keeping them in place, but also of making them more global and globally accessible. We may lose something, as I suggest, in digitizing paper, but we also stand to gain a great deal. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. <laughs>